PowerPoint up here. So yeah, as I was saying yesterday, um, the first ILM we talked about discrete inputs and outputs, things that were either a one or a zero or on or off. And the second ILM here, um, the second ILM moves into the analog part. So we'll be talking about analog input cards, analog output cards, uh, some math instructions. We'll start looking at how we take a 4 to 20 milliamp signal from a transmitter and feed it into the PLC program. And the PLC program changes that 4 to 20 into a digital number. Uh, and that kind of ties into what we were talking about yesterday about signal converting. So that's using the analog to digital converter and the digital to analog converter within the system. So that all ties into stuff that we're doing today. So, what slideshow do you see here? Do you guys see a big one or do you see one with my little things on the sides? Probably the things on the sides of that. Yeah, this yeah, is updated. Computer screen. Looks like you are editable pages. All right, we're gonna, I gotta, so I'm gonna figure this out here. Whoa, this is just crazy. All right, share screen, stop share screen. Every once in a while, you're going to have these little glitches. Try this. And if you here. want to go into uh, to like make it the big slide uh, on the top left hand corner. Oh yeah, you got her. That's it. So I, I'm, try I'm trying to make it so that I can see the little slides on my side because I have notes on them. Oh, you guys, okay. You guys can see the big slide. So hopefully you're looking at the big slide and I'm looking at the little slide. Yeah, that's what we got going on. Excellent. All right, so yeah, as I was saying, Part B here builds on uh, Part A where we talked about the screen, now we're getting into the analog stuff. So this is uh, really uh, meat and potatoes as far as control systems goes for uh, us as technicians. This is the very basic elemental stuff. How do we get a transmitter signal into the PLC system? How do we get it converted from 4 to 20 to some kind of a uh, binary number? How do we associate that binary number in 4 to 20 to an engineering unit like kilograms per hour or uh, percent or anything like that? So that's kind of what we're covering in this ILM here. And then uh, we look at how we use the ladder diagram to do all those functions for us individually and then kind of work into the system. So let's see what we got here. Describe PLC ladder logic programs that use math instructions and PID control. So uh, pretty basic in terms of uh, advanced instructions here. So they're all part of the your basic toolkit of ladder programming stuff. Okay, so lots of writing, lots of explanation in the ILM. I'm just gonna kind of hit on the highlights here uh, in the slides. Starting out with analog inputs, and we'll look at analog, uh, analog outputs, which are similar, but different. Uh, backwards, I guess you could say. So an analog data is stored as an, as an integer or a real value. And again, that's either uh, a number or a number with a decimal place. Um, an analog to digital converter is a component inside the AI module here that converts the electrical signal from uh, the field device, a transmitter, into a proportional binary number. So this is all within the AI module in the, in the rack here. here. Alan Bradley or your Honeywell or your Delta V or whatever it happens to be. Here's your AI module and then this connects to the uh, processor of the PLC. So it shares the data back and forth. The data comes in. We're measuring, in this case here, the example is a pressure transmitter here. So we're measuring a, a pressure range of 0 to 710 kPa. So we talk about something called scaling. We want, we want a number, a, a binary number that represents 0 KPA and we want a binary number that represents 100 KPA. It also happens to represent 100% and also happens to represent zero. So a lot of the functions that are done are done in the PLC program through through math uh, function, I they call it function blocks or modes, but that we're going to be discussing today. So we take a raw number that's generated by the transmitter and it's usually it depends on the number of bits of your, of your system, but a 16-bit system, for example, will generate a range of numbers from minus 32,768 to positive 32,700, a difference of about 65,534 or 
or something like that. At any rate, that's the scale that the, the computers like to work on. And we have to use this scale in order to convert 4 to, 4 to 20 into, into something that the, the whole system can use, the HMI can use, uh, all the math functions and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, all of that's done inside the analog uh, input block here and in the ILM. Uh, there's plenty of examples that will show you how we how we kind of get this calculation. But long story short, if the PLC wants to see a range like this and we want to go 4 to 20 or 4 to 20.2 in this case, let's call it 4 to 20 for easier math. I'll take the difference between this is 65,000 and change. I'll take the uh, difference between uh, 0 and 20 milliamps and how much 4 is of that, so 20%. If I did 20% of this, you'd see I get a number somewhere around. Um, I can't remember what the number is, but if I subtracted it, it's around 12,000. If I subtracted it from 32,000 negative, it would give me negative 20,000 value that represents 0.4 milliamp. Long story short, it'll make a lot more sense um, when you see the examples in the ILM. And then doing the same math at, at a, anyway, we'll, we'll leave that for now. So long story short, we're doing uh, a conversion between binary, uh, binary data that's used by the PLC program and software and the transmitter, which is putting an electrical signal, and then we're doing scaling, which is an important uh, function that's done inside the AI module. Boy, that was windy. Okay, analog output module, same kind of idea, of course, only backwards. Uh, digital analog converter is a component in the AO module this time that takes the digital information that the processor has processed and sent back to the AI, AO module. It comes from the computer, of course, as a, as a binary value, goes into the digital analog converter. The digital analog converter converts it into a milliamp source. It gets sent out, sent out to our, our final control element. And again, scaling is always done, right? The value 0% to 100%. We need a number that represents zero. We need a number that represents 100. Um, pay attention to some of these numbers because they're pretty standard with a lot of different systems and it'll save you having to do some of that silly math I was talking about earlier. But, uh, some things you need to pay, pay attention to. So another thing that you want to pay attention to is what your scaling value is. Um, we learned, uh, was it last year or the year before? Uh, and I think I might have a slide that speaks to it, but lots of the transmitters can fail high or fail low. Uh, and in some cases, like 21.75 milliamps or something like that will be your high range and zero will be uh, a lower number. So those are all things that you need to take into consideration. But for now, analog input card does that thing. Analog output card does the same thing in the other direction. So once we get our inputs and we get our outputs and we're bringing that data either from the transmitter uh, coming into the system or from the system going out to our final control element, that's great. We have some numbers floating around in there. So in order for a control system to work, we have to be able to do something uh, with those numbers. It's part of the automation process, of course. And the first basic type of instruction we're going to look at uh, is a comparison instruction. So a comparison instruction can compare, as the name would imply, many different things. Um, the common ones are equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, not equal to. Uh, these are standard compare uh, variables that you'll find in ladder diagram programming. Uh, if you ever had to do uh, Excel spreadsheet stuff same type of thing that goes goes on in that uh, only in their own little format so the block itself basically has an enable so if the run preceding it is true it will be enabled on the input and then put input to uh, these are uh, one of them is typically a transmitter that's measuring a value as an input another one is typically a uh, set point or something like that. So let's we'll say we'll compare this value to this value. If it's equal to, this will be true. If it's this one's less than this one, that'll be true. If this one's greater than this one, that'll be true, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the uh, different variables that kind of go in there. All we're doing is comparing input one to input two. And if it meets the uh, argument that we have here, it'll turn Q positive. 
marvelous. So an example where we use a comparison instruction, for example, here we have a diagram of a lift station with a sump pump. It's got a handoff auto station here. We have a level transmitter over here. And the idea, of course, is if the level gets too high, the pump will turn on. It'll pump the stuff out of the uh, sump. Once the level drops below a certain level, the pump will turn off again. Uh, if we wanted to start it manually, we just come over here and press start. If we wanted to stop it manually, we can just press stop. Uh, hand off auto switch, of course, if it's in hand, we could do what I just said. If it wasn't in hand, if it was in auto, this would happen over here. So let's look at what happens over here uh, in terms of uh, analog input happening over here. And in this case, it's a discrete output because all we're doing is turning uh, pump on and off. So analog input, discrete output. So I believe the ILM says, looking at my notes here, says we're sitting in a situation um, where this thing is at four and a half meters. And I believe it trips on at six meters and trips off, I don't know the value in, in my head, at 0.5 meters right here. So. We're going to compare what's the transmitter reading to a set point of six meters. So we're sitting at 4.5. Uh, stuff is pouring into the into the lift station sump, and suddenly we hit six. Or let's say that we haven't hit six, six, six yet. We're sitting here at four and a half. We're looking for input one to be greater than input two. So for four and a half, four and a half is not greater than six. So the pump is off. The level rises six meters 6.1 meters all of a sudden lt30 is at 6.1 meters the input or a set point is at six meters one is greater than two so latch one is going to energize when latch one energizes and latch two is not energized which is what the natural state is that will make this run true which will turn on the pump and turn on the uh, latching branch uh, around the first latch. So the pump will run, the pump will run, the pump will run. Pump is running, the level's dropping, four meters, three meters, two meters, one meter, and 0.5 meters, 0.499 meters. At 0.499 meters, LT compares itself to the setting of 0.5. It says if input one is less than input two, so 0.49 is less than 0.5, we're going to energize latch two. As soon as we energize latch two, this examine off instruction becomes false. The rung becomes false. The pump turns off. The latch that de-energizes and so on. And then it'll repeat itself as the process requires. Any questions? Perfect. So this is more what we're focused on here. Uh, the previous slides just kind of give you a background information on the amount of things that are going on between the level transmitter or analog input card and what actually happens out in the field. So we're doing uh, a lot of scaling, uh, for doing some math functions, and then we get a product at the end. Next slide here, gas detection, a little bit more complicated of an example here. Uh, I guess it would have been wise for me to have the write up in front of me, but we can look at the logic diagram and see what happens over here. We have a compare instruction that says A is less than B. If the transmitter is less than three milliamps, we want a fault. If we have a fault, we're probably gonna have this alarm light. We're gonna have a compare instruction that says A is greater than B. So if A the transmitter ever gets greater than 5.6, we're gonna have an output here that's gonna be an alarm and also looks like an exhaust fan. Then we have another uh, logical comparison here that says A greater than B, transmitter greater than 7.2, indicating greater than LEL. That means we are going to have uh, an event signal or, or a shutdown signal. Uh, also tied in with that shutdown signal is a hand switch. So if the level drops back down again, the operator can come by and hit the, hit the reset. And, start it all over again so again lots of different things going on this is uh, the background behind a gas detection system so we have a transmitter that you you see on the wall and we have a 
sometimes wish that your mom may see on the wall and this is all the stuff that's going on in the background you'll notice uh in the heading here this is plc lab 2. so this would be very important for you to wrap your head around the logical uh, sequence of operations here so let's just quickly look at the diagram and see what goes on so we where do we want to say that we're sitting i guess i should open my ilm maybe it tells me a default give me a second here gentlemen and doesn't give us a starting point. Okay, so let's just look here. Uh, input one less than input two. So if the transmitter is less than three, so we've lost uh, we've lost power. For example, what's going to happen? This is going to be two. Uh, become Q is going to become true, and AZL or light light one hundred one is going to energize. AZL1 energizes, does it happen anywhere else? Doesn't do anything. So we lose power, a light comes on. What happens if we get to 5.6? So this is a lower explosive limit, less than 10% LEL. If one is greater than two, what happens? If transmitter is greater than 5.6 or we've exceeded our LEL, what's gonna happen? AZX101 is going to energize. When AZX101 energizes, it's going to energize this bit in the first rung. That's going to allow continuity between that side and this side. It's going to turn on our light. Okay, so if we get LEL, we are also going to get a light. Does AZX come anywhere else? It does not. Okay, so things are getting worse, things are getting worse, gas is building, and suddenly the gas level is over 20% LEL. We look at the third argument, uh, input one greater than input two, so transmitter is reading 10 milliamps, so serious LEL, someone's going to die here pretty soon. This Q becomes true, this latch instruction, which we haven't discussed yet, is going to energize. So YZ101 is going to energize. That's going to energize any associated bit with the same address. And you know, they don't show them here, but these will all have the same address. So this will energize. This will energize, turning on AZX101, which I believe was the fan. Yes, the fan. Uh, and also this one here is going to energize, which is also going to turn on the light. Those are going to stay on. And then let's say now we're coming down from 20% LEL, 19% LEL, and we're now down to seven. This Q is no longer true. So you would think if this is no longer true that this would de-energize, would turn off this, turn off this, and everything would go back to normal. That is the difference between a normal coil output and the latch and unlatch type coil, which are different. The latch will not unlatch unless it's told to unlatch, which means that if the power goes off and comes back on again, if this was energized, it's going to remain energized. So it's you've got to be careful when you use this, because if your plant shuts down unexpectedly and then comes back on unexpectedly, Everything that was running is going to come on instantaneously. So anyway, how does it unlatch? Operator comes over, hits hand switch 101, which energizes the unlatch instruction. Notice the address is the same. Unlatch instruction de-energizes everything, and we get back to where we were. Long, drawn-out explanations here, folks, but uh, hopefully... Uh, I don't lose any of you. Anybody got any questions at this point? Someone make a noise so I can tell I'm not talking to myself. You're doing good there, Teach. Uh, right on. Thanks, Ray. So, uh, good, uh, good uh, very good uh, materials, good stuff. Uh, did you get anything back for the remote access for the simulation for students? Oh, come on. I'm one crisis at a time, Michael. One crisis at a time. Let me get let me get Blackboard straightened out. 
uh, and then I will work on this remote access. Yeah. So Thank thanks you. For reminding, thanks for reminding me, though. I think I just need to send an email to IT. The only problem is IT is working from home. So yeah, I'll, I'll do that today. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, moving ahead. Latch and unlatch. I basically already uh, explained this latch and unlatch thing for you. Uh, latch instruction will hold true until it is told to unlatch. Same addresses, blah, 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 blah. What happens here, press the start button. This bit energizes, causes the latch to energize, which turns on the motor. Um, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, so this is a motor stop start thing here. The electricians would like to see the overloads in here. Uh, nothing else exciting here. If I uh, hit stop, which is, uh, why is that? I think this diagram could be wrong. Anyway, latch and unlatch. I've already, I've already explained what they do, so I'm not going to worry about this diagram, which is causing me a headache. All right, so compare instructions, pretty simple, equal to, then, greater, less, above, whatever, that kind of thing. Um, compare instructions. Now we're going to look at another type of instruction set, which are math instructions. So different types of arguments here. Nothing unusual that you've never seen before. So addition, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all these wonderful things. And there's many, 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 many more of them. Uh, and just like the last block here, we're going to have input one and input two. And then we're going to have uh, a type that's associated with one of these arguments. Uh, and if the arguments are true, then we're going to get, uh, sorry, we're going to get a, an output energized on Q. Uh, the EN and the ENO are just part of the of the rung that uh, kind of enables the function. So if everything in front of here is true, this just provides a, a, a ground, I guess, is the word I'm going to use is probably not the proper technical word to use, but just closes that, closes that circuit. So therefore, the EN instruction is a Boolean instruction. It's a one or a zero. It's either on or off. Input one and input two are integer or real values, which means that they're uh, uh, a number, uh, a changing number from 32,000 negative to 32,000 positive or something like that, but a number could have decimals, may not have decimals depending on whether they're inter-real, but we'll talk about that later. Um, ENO, part of the this part of this uh, rung, so they're the same type of data, so uh, one or a zero. And then the Q is also uh, an integer or a real value in this case. So we're comparing some math here, we're adding it together. So of course, we're going to want a number uh, representing that to come out of it. So two plus two is four, is what we're looking for. All right, so one of the good applications uh, for a math instruction is calculating volume. So every, uh, you know, we have a cylindrical tank and we can do the, the diameter and times the height and all that kind of wonderful stuff. Or we can use a level transmitter to say every milliamp represents uh, 12.566 meters. And I'm thinking that's pretty close to the explanation in the ILM. Um, that's basically what these couple of rungs sh are showing here. Uh, we're doing a volume calculation with the timer using a level transmitter uh, in the timer. I'll talk about second because I believe in your ILM there's a there's a page break right here and it talks briefly just about the volume calculation function and then it will talk about the timer function and why that's even here. So what's happening in this math and function here is we're taking the level transmitter value uh, and we'll make it easy and say the 4 to 20 value and we're going to say that every uh, milliamp that the transmitter goes up, we are going to multiply by 12.566 to represent the amount of volume in that tank. Uh, and then we can use that volume number in gallons or liters when we come out. So uh, pretend that this bit's not here right now and the timer or the, the math uh, function is just doing its thing. So it's going to do 4 milliamps. It's not going to be 4 milliamps. It's going to be minus 20,000 and change times 12.2. And it's going to give us the mathematical answer to that value as volume. We'll then use this volume, which will be addressed to a, to a tag. And we can put it on a graphic. 
uh, on a screen, or we can attach it to a, a, a bar graph, you know, that's going up and down, or we can attach it to the graphic of the tank that's showing the tank getting full or, or getting empty or whatever we want it to do. Uh, because it's volume, it's probably just going to be a math number. Uh, if it was level, uh, it would probably be a picture. So that's basically what the idea of the of the math function is. Why are we got a timer in here? Well, because there's no reason for to do a volume calculation on a on a level transmitter, particularly uh, continuously. Uh, the PLC systems vary in how fast they scan, but very fast, uh, 50 milliseconds. For, for, an, for an argument. So every 50 milliseconds, it will do the math function and generate a new value here. We don't need that. It's a, we're calculating the volume uh, of level, level's pretty slow. So in order to save PLC resources and computer resources, we can use a timer to create basically a sample rate uh, for an analog transmitter. So that's what this timer is in here for. So basically what, what it's saying is when this timer Q is not timing, this rung will be true. So that turns on the timer. The timer will time for five seconds. After that five seconds is up, Q becomes energized. That turns this on, it does the math calculation and it's essentially going off and on, off and on, off and on in a five second cycle. So pulling uh, a math calculation from these variables doing the math every five seconds and updating every five seconds. So using that to save resources is the long or the short story of my long story. Here's where math really comes in handy. Uh, here's the input output formula. So those of you who may be like me, uh, who even to this day sometimes have to look this up, um, it's done in the PLC program for us, of course. Um, we can do this calculation on paper, and you have many times, but it's done many times per second, 20 times per second at 50 milliseconds per scan inside the PLC system. So this is an important one to know. Uh, in the real world, if you ever find yourself programming, you're gonna need to do you're gonna need to know this because you're going to want to scale. You're going to want to scale a value into an engineering unit, and you want to know how to do it. So, a multitude of math functions happening here: division, multiplication, addition. Let's see how this works. Okay, here I have a temperature switch, temperature transmitter. Now, why do I have a temperature switch here? Input one. Minus input two. Let's. I'm not sure why the hell. I guess this is just starting the process. So what's happening in function block one here is we're having input one subtracted from input two. In this case, it's the uh, measure variable from our temperature transmitter, whatever that happens to be. Uh, looks like four milliamps with this value here, and it's going to and it's going to take that value subtract this value. So this is input transmitter minus our lower range value of our input, right? Lower range value for uh, the transmitter, as we saw a few pages back at 4 milliamps, minus 20,000 ish. I'm just going to round off for conversation's sake. So input minus LRV, that's what's going on in this block, gives us a number called TT raw. So this is the raw number generated from the current reading minus the lower range value. We use that number now in the second run. We progress down to the second run. We take TT101 raw, which we calculated here. It gets compared in this fashion. One divided by two. One divided by two. This band, if you look back a few pages between the lower range value and the upper range value, was this number. So this is what we're doing now is we're doing this number, which we calculated in this block, divided by this number, which we're calculating in this block. That gives us a new number. We take this new number, a fractional number generated by rung two, and it gets in, inserted into rung three 
as input one, and we're now gonna multiply input one times input two. What's input two? That's the span of our output, 120 degrees. So input one times input two performs the math, gives us a new value, TT101 span. Whew. Big breath. Take the new calculated value, TT101 span, insert it into rung four as input number one. Here we're doing input one plus input number two, in this case, minus 20 degrees, input one plus input two gives us a new value in degrees Celsius, which we move to rung five. Rung five is a compare instruction, not a math instruction. Input one less than input two. So if input one is less than 47 degrees, we're gonna have a low temperature light, let's call it. Rung six, if input one is greater than input two, or input one is greater than 53 degrees Celsius, I'm gonna have a high input light or coil or whatever it happens to be. So these two bits also, whether they turn on a light or working on, working on a bit here, uh, let's work them in here and see what happens. If temperature switch one is closed, which it had to be to get this bus rolling, this would be green. If low becomes true and high is not true, so temperature is below 47, this will be green because the switch is closed. This will be green because this lights up. This will be green because this is not lit up. The heater will turn on. That energizes the heater. Temperature rises, hits 53 degrees. That turns on the high coil. The high coil turns on, making this untrue, which breaks this rung, turns off the heater. How is that? Good? Great. Good job, buddy. Keep moving along. Here we go, PID instructions. So lots of words, lots of pages on a PID instruction, but uh, PID instructions come into play because of course we need, uh, we need some values that we compare to, right? We can compare to a set point, for example, compare our set point to our transmitter value. Uh, we can compare our process variable to our transmitter value. Um, so that gets worked into the control system, obviously. Um, and of course, every, uh, every good analog loop has a PID, at least a PID instruction, and if not something more complicated. So let's start out looking at PID. Okay, the PID instruction, of course, produces feedback control. Here's a PID loop for a temperature transmitter that is opening and closing a valve. We have different inputs at this point. Now you'll see we have manual set point adjust, which is an analog input uh, in slot five. Slot five, we have a transmitter, analog input, slot five, channel zero. The set point adjust is channel one. The manual output adjust is channel two. We also have an analog output device here in slot six, that's the valve driver. Uh, this is also has a discrete input module in slot three with an auto manual switch. So uh, the manual switch, of course, you uh, close it, works with the program, worry about that later. So these are all different things. A multitude of different things get fed into the PID block is what I'm getting at here. So process variable, okay, input. Slot five, channel zero, so that's our transmitter, measuring the process variable, right? Makes sense. Uh, slot five, channel one, set point. In this case, it's the manual set point. Input slot five, channel two is our tieback or our manual output adjust or reset tieback, bump lift transfer, remember all those wonderful, wonderful, wonderful world words that we had last year. There's still big words this year. Uh, input, a nice, nice change of address here. The auto manual switch uh, represented down here. And on the other side over here, of course, controller output, our only output here, output slot six, channel one. So all these things get fed into the PID instruction block. 
This is what it looks like in a block diagram here. We have our tie back, we have our set point, we have our PD, we have a, a manual switch, auto switch going on here, which basically sets our mode, right? Whether we're, we're just doing the controller output, adjustment here through this tie back knob, signal goes straight to the valve, or if the switch is closed as it is now, we get our PID function uh, doing its math. We're going to talk about math. Uh, soon. Okay, uh, um, point number two here, not listed in the IEC 611.31-3 uh, specification because it's vendor specific. All of this stuff that we're seeing in the ILM here, uh, not related, well, it's not related to any of our systems. It could be very close to another uh, brand of manufacturer in terms of these blocks, but these blocks aren't exactly what you're going to find when you get into the um, Allen Bradley stuff or the or the Delta V stuff. Uh, they'll look a, a little bit different. Parameters typically very close to the same, um, but they're all a little bit different. All right, PID instruction with HMI. I'm not sure why they introduced this in here. Uh, Almost any of these instructions you can work into the HMI if there's an output, uh, an, a, an analog output, you can use it for an HMI. Uh, you know, if, even if there's a discrete output, you can use it for an HMI. You know, you can, it comes to the operator's interface to tell you whether the ESD valve is tripped or not. That would be a discrete signal sent to the HMI. Uh, tank level, for example, can be a sliding bar scale or a graphic in the tank that shows the level rising. Um, almost all of these things can be used. They all are used with HMI, so I don't know what the point is here, uh, except that it ties into the HMI, of course, because the PID instruction, the operator is sitting at a computer and that's where he's inputting um, the set point value, the manual output value. It's not, it's not a dial, like a knob. Like, well, I mean, it could be a knob, but the reality of it is, is he's sitting here at the operator workstation entering the set point, uh, et cetera, the proportional, the integral, the derivative values, and they're getting displayed on the HMI touch panel. So I think that's all that they're really trying to tell you here. Um, yeah, I think that's all they're trying to say. So PID block instruction configuration, uh, talking about tuning algorithm configuration so that would be your PID settings uh, alarms of course within the PID block here uh, you can set alarms high alarms low alarms low low high high blah 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 uh, scaling uh, just as we talked scaling before uh, same concept different block all right uh, instruction timing and we sort of touched on instruction timing earlier and Timing is important for a lot of different reasons. One, um, you don't want to have to use more resources performing a function than you have to. That's the first reason that we talked about. Uh, the second reason timing is important is because you want the data that the system pulls from the field device and uses to be current enough to be useful to you. So there's a relationship between the scanning capabilities of the PLC system and the scanning abilities of the transmitter. And we've touched on uh, scan time, I think, in transmitters in third year and a little bit how it ties into the scan cycle of the PLC system. Um, but that's the second reason why, why time is important when you're programming, aside from not using uh, more resources than you have to, uh, to making sure that you have accurate data or data that's not stale. Okay, so loop update time in a PID instruction must match its execution time. So you ideally, if the transmitter scans once a second, you're going to want the uh, control system to scan at least once a second. Okay. At update analog inputs and outputs 10 times faster than the loop date time. So 10 times faster. So if this is done there every second, 
This is done every tenth of a second. Long story short. Okay, so that's timing. Still timing. Looks like is that slide out of the scale? It kind of is. All right, periodic timing or periodic task. Um, kind of drops kind of out of the sky here when we talk about periodic tasks. When we get into programming later, uh, we'll spend some time talking about periodic tasks and continuous tasks. So within a program, there are tasks that are executed continuously. Most tasks are executed continuously. Um, some tasks, typically less critical ones, are what we call periodic tasks, meaning that we can execute them in a dramatic way once a day, uh, in a less dramatic way once every five seconds. So if it's available in a PLC, you're going to want to operate the PID instruction in a periodic task set to match the loop update time. And again, it's to try to get everything in sync to make maximum use of your computing power resources uh, more, than, more than anything else. Uh, there's no need typically to check how much a temperature has changed every 50 milliseconds, right? Uh, you get into faster processes, uh, flow control, for example. Yeah, you might want to check it every half a second or, or something like that. But temperature, really, you could look at this every 30 seconds, probably. Uh, a big tank level, you could probably look at every 30 seconds. So why not make it a periodic task and make life easier for for the you know the things doing the work, the bits and bytes hiding inside the processor. All right. Um, here we take a little jump into looking how we can apply uh, something called a subroutine into uh, a ladder diagram. And we'll talk about what a subroutine is and the, the process of uh, working one of them into a ladder program. All right, subroutines are a self-contained program that performs a specific operation within a block of program logic. So the definition is a little bit confusing. Um, but it's relatively simple. What, is, what a subroutine is, is, is a side job, basically. It's a side job that's written over here that gets inserted into the main routine. Whenever we need a, a contractor for a quick job, we, we use a subroutine. It's like having a subcontractor. You're, you're this guy doing the day-to-day -day work most of the time, but every once in a while, someone's got to clean the toilet. So you hire a contractor, uh, that's a subroutine, and he comes in and does a certain amount of work for you, gives you the result that you want, and you can carry on with your business. So that's the most logical way to do it. To put it into programming terms, a subroutine, and the great example of the subroutine is the uh, scaling calculation that needs to be done for a transmitter. Uh, you can write it out every single time for every single transmitter that you have in a plant, hundreds of them, thousands of them, or you can write one subroutine with the scaling logic in it. And every time you need a transmitter to be scaled, you just refer it to the subroutine. It jumps over there, does the math, and gives you an answer. So that's the purpose of a subroutine, is to do the frequent tasks that are done all the time, but to keep all the mess out of your main program. Okay, so to do a subroutine, we have two instructions. One of them is the subroutine itself. The second one is uh, a, jump, a jump to subroutine instruction or a JSR. So a JSR or a uh, SPR is what we're gonna be looking at. So the subroutine is the logic itself. The JSR is what tells the subroutine to execute within a master program or master routine. Okay, so here's the blocks inside of a JSR. Uh, we have the enable, enable block, which is a Boolean, just the rung being true to enable or tell this to do its job. Same as all the other ones we've looked at. So solve the line coming into here usually, maybe there's a switch. Uh, solve the line here, closing the, closing the rung. Input parameter here in this case can be Boolean, integer, or real. Uh, 
this is the routine that you wanted to, this is data you want to copy to a tag in the subroutine. Okay, so this is going to be one of the values from the transmitter, for example. Multiple input parameters are possible, meaning that this is an optional argument, meaning you can have this or you cannot have this, or depending on your system, and a little early to be talking about it, but lots of them will have options where you can click an option box here and you can add an input. That's what that means when we're talking about that. The return parameter, uh, important in the JSR here, this tag uh, in this routine, uh, sorry, the tag in this routine that you want to copy a result of the subroutine. You can also have multiple return parameters and it's also an optional argument. So we take our transmitter value here, uh, however, any, whatever number it is from the transmitter, it sends it out, it goes to the subroutine, wherever the subroutine is there. The subroutine does a math function. It's got a little function in it called a return. That return will come to here and that gives us our, our number back into our main program. Hard to wrap your head around when you're looking at two squares here, I understand. Um, but when you read it, hopefully my explanation uh, helps a little bit. Okay, there's the subroutine uh, instruction itself. So again, an enabling run and our input parameter here, the enabling run of Boolean values. Our input parameter can be Boolean integer or real. And this is the tag in the subroutine which you want to copy the corresponding input parameter from the JSR, right? This is a transmitter value coming into our subroutine. Does it make sense when we see one put together here, which is coming up quickly? Okay, there's a return instruction again. This is uh, within the subroutine ladder logic uh, routine. Uh, the ladder logic, the rungs up here do some math functions, for example, doing our input output formula. Uh, we get to a return parameter, and this is the value that's going to get set, sent back to our main routine. Okay, so here is how it looks in real life. It's very complicated talking about it, but not so bad when you got it all on the page. So here's our ladder diagram and our main routine. No conditions have to be met for our subroutine, in this case, to execute. We have input parameter one, input parameter two, and the return parameter. Don't know right now, but this is what it's going to look like. And this, this run is just energized. So here's what our subroutine in this case. Our subroutine is going to take value A and value B, which are going to be coming out of our uh, out of our main inputs here. Value A, one input one and input two are about value A and value B. They probably should have labeled them the same. I don't know. Um, so that tells us this is the data we're using in our subroutine. The rung is solid and true, so the subroutine will execute the next rung. This is solid and true. Anytime it's solid and true, it'll move to the next rung. So the first step here, input one minus input two. So it's gonna do A minus B, and it's gonna return a result. The result is gonna go to the next rung. If this bit is true, it's going to return whatever this number is back to our main program, back to here. Okay, if this is not true, uh, da, 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 da. this is not true, nothing happens. I'm not going to explain that. Let's, let's move on to the next line. Um, it is true, it does that, it gives a result. Why am I confused? I'm confused here. And then it moves on to the next calculation anyway. The next calculation will take the previous value, add it into the the B value here, compare it to the trend, uh, sorry, the other value, value from the input output calculation here doing the addition, it will generate a result. The, I should really have the walkthrough on here. Let me pause here for a second, guys, because I'd rather do this one time. What values are they using? Okay, 
let's look. This is on page 32. Um, if you want to follow along while looking at the picture on the screen here. Oh, I wrote, I wrote the numbers down here in my notes. Um, this I usually do on the board in the classroom. I don't know if there's any way that I can do this, but let's, can I draw in here? Design animation is not. Okay, well, yeah. So let's see, let's just read through the ILM here. Uh, bullet points, page 32. JSR instruction room one of the main program calls the subroutine to routine A and passes the value of its two input parameters. So as I said, it takes these two values, moves them down to here. The first run of the subroutine contains the subroutine instruction that assigns its local tags A and B to our input tags that were moved in here. Wonderful. The value of these tags in the ILM says value A is 25 and value B is 15. So this is 25 and this is 15. And if I was a little bit more technologically advanced, I would have a pen and I could write on the screen. But if you're, if you got your book open, you could write them in there. So anyway, we've got 25 and 15 in here. So that 25 and 15 will be in here because we haven't done anything to it yet. So 25 and 15, we're going to do 25 minus 15 is going to give us a result of 10. Okay, rung, store, rung number two stores this 10 in the result. And the result, the function then moves on to the next rung. If instruction A is true in rung three, which has a return instruction, returns execution back to the main program. Okay, so if this is true, it returns execution back to the main program and passes the value of the result tag as its first re return parameter. So that means that it will send this 10 back to here. Okay, the returned parameters are sound to that output tag. If instruction A is false right here, then this rung is not executed and we'll move down to rung four. We have 25 uh, and 15 still as our values sitting in here. This time we're gonna add them together. 25 plus 15 gives us a result of 40. The result of 40 is then carried over to this return block here. And if instruction uh, A is false and B is false, nothing happens and we go on to rung six. Rung six doesn't have a condition, so it will automatically send a 50 back to the thing. If rung B, however, was true, it would return the result here, which was 40 back to the system. I know it's a little bit confusing, um, but I, yes, question. So I saw you have A and B, which one is instruction A and which one is instruction B? This is, it's, it's really kind of irrelevant now for our purposes. These will, uh, this, like in a regular, if we were doing a regular scaling type thing, these would all, they wouldn't have bits in here usually to as conditions. Um, this would this comes from this comes probably from from somewhere in the main routine. But I would don't worry about it. It's it's not really important. Okay, thanks. It's just a way of demonstrating, just a way of demonstrating the different possibilities. Yeah, because your instruction A and B were not defined in this ladder. No, no, that's right. It's just a, it's just a theor theoretical way of, of um, being able to explain the different possibilities. So you have one that's direct, one that relies on one or the other, and then one that relies on both. All right. Uh, so that's a simple version of a subroutine. And yeah, I know it probably doesn't sound too simple yet, um, but it gets worse. 
So we have nested subroutines. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about it. I'm not even sure if there's an example uh, in the ILM of a nested subroutine, but they do exist. So I'm going to mention it here really quickly for you. Uh, and a nested subroutine is just a subroutine within a subroutine within a master routine, as you see here. So here we have a run in the master that calls for a subroutine. Uh, the subroutine uh, executes, does does a couple of runs of logic here. If this is true, it, it, it instructs it to go to another subroutine where it does something else. So it's kind of like a, uh, an AND instruction almost, really. If, if, I, if this happens, do this. And if this happens, do this. So it's kind of a messy AND or kind of situation going on. But really all you need to know is that they can be nested into each other. <clears throat> okay, here's an example of some logic uh, that's executing a repetitive calculation. Um, this is a good one for uh, doing the input output formula and this is kind of what it would look like here. Here I have two temperature transmitters, TT101 and TT102. Both of them on different analog input channels, channel 0, channel 1 of slot 5. Here we have the input to one JSR being the first channel, the input to the second JSR being the second channel, so each transmitter gets its own jump to subroutine, okay, which makes sense. I've got a transmitter, I need to convert some numbers, right? We're going to need to do it for every transmitter, so this is how it looks. So my main routine, I have a jump, jump to subroutine instruction that says, take the value from my transmitter and compare it to my TT101 calculation, or give me a number that represents that calculation. That's what we're saying here. So uh, jump to subroutine. Here we end up with a subroutine. We get our input raw coming from our transmitter here, input 50, input 51, whatever it happens to be. It executes because this run is true, and we drop that input raw value into our formula here. Our math then, of course, here we have, look, all this wonderful stuff pre-designed pre for us. So our lower range value for 4% minus 20,285. Our span at 49,931. Our engineering unit span out at 150 degrees. Our lower range value uh, out at minus 50 degrees. So all entered into... Uh, this wonderful calculate scheme, which really would represent a bigger chunk of ladder logic, right? For simplification, it's just in this big block. It's going to do all the math. It's going to give me a value called outscale. I'm going to go on the next rung, take the value calculated from outscale as my return parameter back to both of our return parameters for these transmitters. So very quick, easy, great example of why you would want to use a subroutine versus having to take uh, the whole section of logic. This is the simplified version, but you know, every single rung that you need to do a math calculation here and have to do it for every single one and then do it again for every single one. This is why subroutines are handy. Okay, so what the heck we got going on here? Subroutines in a ladder. Oh, I don't even know what this means. So this is just a this is just a check. Uh, so a bunch of check logic. Uh, do we have errors? Do we not have errors? Uh, and doing some returning values. I don't even know what this is about. This was added. I did this last edit seconds before I logged on with you guys this morning. So what are they? What are they saying here? For rung one, if there are no main errors meaning that that bit is false. The subroutine is ex executed, saying that everything is okay and the conveyor will run. Uh, run sorry. Uh, for run two, if there are no feed system errors and the main conveyor is running, then the feed unit will operate. Perfect. Uh, for run three, if there are no sorting errors and the feed system is running okay, then the sorting unit will be executed running the sort system. 
Interesting. Very nice. So you see now they got jumped to subroutine used for uh, running little sub contracting jobs throughout the main program. So there'll be a lot of different times where you can just cut and paste a subroutine into uh, a main routine. Useful stuff. I think that's pretty close to the end here, fellas. And it is. So what did we learn today? PLCs can use analog data with compare instructions, math instructions, and PID instructions to control a process. We learned that subroutines allow programmers to group logic for organizational purposes and minimizing redundant programming. A lot of stuff in there, a lot of talking. Um, but again, these are fundamental building blocks moving forward. That's it. That's all. There ain't no more. Do your homework. Excellent. Excellent. I can do that. This this was a, a lot longer lecture than yesterday. Was it? Yes. Yesterday was a half hour. I think that was uh yeah. I think 